It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, question pops in your brain, just write it down on any video. I gather them up and I will answer them here. Stick around to the end. We got another special guest answerer, uh, Simon Dan. Uh, so stick around. It's, it's pretty fun. All right, let's get into it. Kitty A. What should it take to verify if the clouds of Venus have life in it? I know this sounds amazing, but one of the places in the solar system that could have life in it is in the upper clouds of Venus. Now, the surface of Venus is terrible, right? 93 times the pressure of, of Earth's atmosphere, searing hot temperatures, it rains sulfuric acid, it's a terrible place to go. But if you get high enough up into the atmosphere, the temperatures come down to a point that's actually kind of comfortable, the pressures get to the point that it's kind of comfortable, and maybe bacterial life could survive in the upper atmosphere on Venus at various altitudes. Now, this life would have to remain aloft in the air, which can happen here on Earth. We find samples of bacteria high up in the atmosphere. So it's possible that there could be life in the atmosphere of Venus. No one has been able to check. No one's bothered checking yet. But you can imagine some future balloon based mission flying to Venus, floating around in the cloud tops, gathering samples. Um, it would be tricky to get the samples back to Earth. Uh, so there's a couple of ideas. One is that you could send some kind of scoop. So a spacecraft that does an atmospheric flyby, it comes through the atmosphere of Venus, just passes through the upper layers of Venus, opens up collection plates, gathers a whole bunch of samples, but doesn't go so slow and so deep through the atmosphere that gets captured by Venus's atmosphere and then comes back to Earth. And we talked about this idea a bit with Mars, a sample return mission from Mars. One of the first ideas was let's just send a spacecraft that flies, just scrapes the top of the atmosphere, collects a bunch of particles and comes back to Earth. And so you could do that with Venus. And the second idea is you send a balloon. The balloon floats around in the atmosphere uh, of Venus, Maybe it does experiments locally and actually does, you know, it's got a chemistry set on board and it's actually gathering samples, it's testing them, it's gathering samples and it's trying to, you know, feed them nutrients and give them sunlight and change the temperatures and see if something will respond. Or maybe it's got some rocket based return vehicle on board. So it would be like the Mars sample return, but it would be a Venus sample return and the balloon would launch the rocket and the rocket would fly to orbit, meet up with some kind of return vehicle. The return vehicle would take the capsule and come back to earth and deliver the sample. I'm sure that there are some Venusian planetary scientists who have been thinking about this idea and would love to get a sample of the upper our atmosphere from Venus. So it's kind of sad right now. There's no, there's no missions at Venus. There's no plans for missions at Venus. And yet it's the most earth like place in the solar system, except for the terrible pressure, temperature and sulfuric acid rain that I mentioned earlier on. Carlos Sariva. Hey Fraser, love the channel. My question, is it possible through a combination of lower gravity and denser atmosphere, say like what happens with Titan, that in such a likely scenario would it be possible to reach low orbit with a jet airplane? Thank you. Thanks Carlos. Uh, kind of no. Um, so let me explain what the problem is with the jet airplane trying to get to orbit here on Earth and then we can kind of extend this, right? So when Airplanes fly in the atmosphere. They have some kind of fuel on board and they are using aerodynamic lift. They're flying through the air and they're using the air as like a fluid to be able to keep themselves aloft. They're pulling in oxygen from the atmosphere. They're adding that to the fuel to combust it. And then they're using that to keep themselves moving forward. And so the problem is, is that only works when you've got this fluid, the atmosphere to fly through, which you do have on Titan and it's thicker and the gravity is going to be lower. And you've got the oxygen for combustion. And that's one of the problems with Titan is that it doesn't have that oxygen for you to be able to combust it. Titan would light on fire if it did, because it's got all these hydrocarbons on the surface. So here on Earth, people have been trying to figure out ways to use a jet engine to help rockets 
get to space, essentially acting like the first stage of a rocket. You have an airplane take off, it's got, you know, Virgin uh, Orbit is doing this, uh, the Strato Launcher, although apparently that's being shut down and the airplane is being sold. But you carry the rocket on board, the airplane flies as fast as it can, as high as it can, so it's got velocity moving forward, and then it drops the rocket, and then the rocket continues on and then goes off into space. And so this sort of shows you what is the kind of configuration, because at the end of the day, you need to be going, it's not about going up, it's about going sideways. 28,000 kilometers per hour to be in low Earth orbit. Now, if you could scale up the atmosphere, maybe the atmosphere was thicker, maybe the atmosphere was bigger, maybe the force of gravity was lower, then you could make that first stage airplane do more work. It could be able to carry the rocket to a higher altitude, it could maybe carry the rocket to a faster velocity, but at the end of the day, it's still going to have its limits and you're still going to need something that can provide propellant where there is no, you know, that carries its own oxidizer on board. So unfortunately, uh, you would never be able to fly a jet aircraft until you're in orbit. At some point, you're going to run out of atmospheric density and you're going to run out of oxidizer on board and your airplane is going to return to Earth or Super Earth or Titan Earth. Dust man. NASA should hire you in some capacity, or at the very least communicate with the public. You're one of the best science communicators since Carl Sagan, up there with the likes of Tyson and Nye, but even better that you're straightforward. Here's hoping you never sell out like so many others. I guess it's good that your funding comes primarily from your viewers, at least that's my understanding. Anyway, cheers and thanks for another informative video. Well, if I went to work for NASA, that would kind of be selling out. So, so let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, the great thing about what I do is that I'm completely independent. I have no, you know, I, I, there's no media company that hires me. I, I, you, the fans, the people who watch the videos, the people who read Universe Today, the people who get my newsletter, the people who listen to my podcast, and of course the patrons, they support the work that we do. And it allows me to do my job. It allows Chad, who's filming, to do his job. It allows the writers on Universe Today to do their job. Uh, and the company has been you know, going for 20 years now. And I hope that it will continue doing it. And the way I keep that rolling is by not spending more money than we make. <laughs> if we make more money, then we can spend more money. Um, and so it's pretty great to be completely independent. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that work in either the academic field or who work for some kind of media company or a public company or some big corporation, and they're always under the gun, right? It's just a matter of time before uh, there's some kind of corporate restructuring or funding changes or the ratings are down and whatever is the thing that they were working on goes away. And so right now, I really feel like it's the perfect situation and I wouldn't have it any other way. And so if some big organization wanted me to do their public relations or do their communications, I'd say no. Uh, I'm too happy with the way this all works right now. And I hope that you guys enjoy the kind of content that we produce and the regularity and the quality that we try to get to. Um, and, and I prefer the independence. So, but thank you so much. It means a lot to me that you're enjoying the work that we're doing, the communication that we're doing. Uh, it, you know, I pass this along to the team and they really appreciate it as well. So thank you. Richard Gould. Are the Earth's Lagrange one, two, four, and five points trapping our space junk? Of course, I do a three-part series on the Lagrange points, and I'm going to get a million questions about the Lagrange points. But now I can just reference back to the Lagrange point videos from this point forward. Um, so as we mentioned in the videos, right, points one, two, and three are meta-unstable. You can't trap anything there. Things will fall out of those points. So the ones you're left with are the Lagrange 4 and 5 points. And no, they're not trapping any of our space junk. Part of it is like you need to move into one of these Lagrange points and then you need to change your velocity so that you then sort of fall into that gravity well. Otherwise, you're going to fall back out of the gravity well. So you might pass through one of these Lagrange points and then you're going to come back out. And a great example of this actually 
was NASA's stereo mission. So it was launched by NASA to observe the sun. One spacecraft was going ahead of the Earth in orbit. One spacecraft was going behind the Earth in orbit. And they would move out along this orbit on either sides. And a few years into their mission, they moved through the Lagrange points. And this was a great opportunity for scientists to study the Lagrange points with these two telescopes. Although they primarily were for looking at the sun, they were able to look around at them as well. And then they, and so they fell into the gravitational well of the Lagrange points and then they came out the other side and just kept going because you because you sort of you gain velocity as you fall into the Lagrange and then you um, and then you slow back down as you come back out of it the other side and then they keep drifting around with the Earth's orbit and so that's what's going to happen with any of our junk that happens to go into those Lagrange points we have to we actually have to to go into the point and then use rockets to essentially fall into that gravity well and then remain there to stick there. So I hope that helps you understand it. Master pack. So Fraser, Kerbal 2, any thoughts? I have no thoughts. Um, I don't like to think about anything that's going to be happening in the future. Any, I've been just disappointed. Like No Man's Sky, right? Oh. We were so excited for No Man's Sky. Now the game is really good, but when it first came out, we were pretty disappointed about how it all went. So I refuse to get excited about any new thing that's coming in, in the future, be it movies, be it video games, anything. Um, that said, uh, you should definitely check out Scott Manley's uh, video. He went and interviewed some of the developers and had a lot more additional information about what's going to be in, in, in No Man's Sky. Uh, it sounds pretty exciting. Uh, there's a lot of really cool ideas that they're going to be bringing into it. I wish I had more time for video games. Uh, a lot of these times I can just, I barely am able to play a lot of games and then I have to, you know, make more videos about space. So... Uh, but I know Chad's pretty excited because then we can start to simulate some cool ideas. Orion spacecraft, you know, the ones that are dropping thermonuclear bombs behind them to accelerate and big space stations and space elevators and stuff. So I think, you know, like Universe Sandbox has given us a way to be able to simulate a lot of weird ideas. I can see uh, Kerbal Space Program 2 giving us another tool to show stuff that maybe there aren't a lot of other videos out there. But that means Chad's gonna have to get really good at Kerbal too. Sir Askelot, does this mean that the Earth and the planets are drifting away from the sun as well? This question is in relation to the one in the last video about tidal locking and how the moon is drifting away from the Earth. And the, the moon is slowing down the rotation of the Earth and it is drifting away from the Earth to compensate. And actually all of the planets in the solar system are drifting away from the sun, but it's for a completely different process. So what's happening is, is that in the sun, in its core, it is converting hydrogen into helium and it's releasing gamma radiation as the byproduct. And that gamma radiation bumps around inside the sun's radiative zone, makes it out through the convective zone, and then flies off into space. And that light is actually causing the sun to give up a tiny little bit of its mass. Now, it is consuming enormous amounts of hydrogen and turning into helium and releasing an enormous amount of energy. Uh, and so, but the actual amount compared to the mass of the sun is, is just tiny. And so every year, all of the planets move out a tiny little bit because of this mass loss, but not because we are slowing down the rotation of the sun. Kevin Corvus, I've mentioned this before on another video, but I'll comment here again. At around 1502 in this video, you state a belief that we're alone in the entire universe. My comment is that it's a huge leap to go from the observation of no aliens seem to have visibly arranged entire systems of stars to the conclusion of we're entirely alone. Just because rearranging stars and black holes seems plausible doesn't make it actually possible. So this is related to this idea that like a type 3 civilization would rearrange all of the stars in their galaxy into a formation that is most useful. Whatever is the ideal form to get as much energy as possible. And so, you know, is it plausible? I mean, we don't know, right? But it doesn't appear there's anything in, that violates the laws of physics. Now, it violates our understanding of how to be able to accomplish these things, but at the end of the day, you're just scaling up physical processes as we understand them today to a, a bigger version. And so if you look back at the, at the demand of energy by human beings 
since we first started with fire to now. It is this smooth line that just goes up and up and up and up and up. And so the, the expectation is that line will continue upward. Now, maybe it won't, right? Maybe we will decide that that's enough energy and the computers will decide that's enough energy that we will stop. But it seems like it's, it's never occurred to us before to not want to use more energy. So it feels like we're going to want to use more energy. And in fact, you can literally predict it. You can chart energy use on a graph over history and then make predictions into the future, not knowing anything, not knowing how that energy is going to be produced, not knowing where it's going to come from, what we're going to use it for, nothing. Just knowing that energy use in the past could indicate energy use in the future. And so then at some point we will want to use all the energy of a star. And then at some point we're going to want to use all the energy of an entire galaxy. And so then you say, okay, so what does a civilization using all of the energy of a star look like? And what does the, a civilization using all the energy of a galaxy look like? So, so those are all just assumptions that, that, that we make when we think about these possibilities. And so by looking out and so then we go, okay, great. So if a civilization was using all of the energy in their entire galaxy, then you would look out into the universe and you would see weird galaxies, galaxies that are in strange shapes that are only giving off infrared radiation because they've enclosed every single one of their stars in Dyson spheres, that that would be the most optimal way to use up all of the energy of a, of a galaxy. Now, Obviously, there's a million assumptions, right? Maybe there's a better way. We don't know. And if that better way, then we'll have to completely change our assumption. Maybe um, there's some reason for the laws of physics that it's just not possible. And we'll have to discover that. So it's, it's more that, that we are, you know, we're trying to think of where the aliens could be. And we're trying to think of reasons like why they wouldn't do the kinds of things that that we would expect that we're going to want to do. We're going to want to explore the solar system. We're going to want to send spacecraft to other star systems. We're going to want to colonize those star systems and then use them to send spacecraft to other star systems. Like these are things that we're going to want to do into the future. And so either no alien civilization and like like literally none ever wants to do that which seems weird, right? Like it seems like like maybe 99% don't want to do that, but 1% does and that 1% colonizes the entire Milky Way. So it's, you know, I'm definitely not using that as the absolute proof positive that we are alone in the universe. I'm using it as just another thing that gives me that suspicion that makes the Fermi paradox so much weirder and it gives me the willies. So, um, you know, I feel like anyone who isn't freaked out by the Fermi paradox hasn't thought about it enough. And, and, and so that, you know, the, the argument that you're moving towards has been brought up many times. And there's some really powerful counter arguments to that idea. So, you know, I, I hope we can at least agree that it's super weird that we don't see evidence of aliens, even though the universe is big and old and they should be going, getting around to everywhere. So that's where I come from. Michael Ramon, is it possible to convert a gas giant into a rocky planet? In theory, yeah. Uh, all you have to do is strip away all of the gas and you're left with the nuggety core of rock. And in fact, Jupiter probably has many times the mass of the Earth in rock inside of it. But it's that getting rid of the gas. Because it's not like it's just a big fluffy gas planet and you just, you know, blow on it gently and all that gas puffs away and then you're left with that rocky nugget. The gravitational force on the surface of Jupiter is significantly higher. Triple? I'm trying to remember what the actual force of gravity, if you could stand on the surface of Jupiter's clouds, it's significant. And so you're going to need a ton of energy to be able to pull that material off. And the calculation that you make is it's called the binding energy. So if you can calculate the binding energy of Jupiter, the total amount of energy to dismantle Jupiter, you could be pretty much left with that little core at the middle. And, uh, and yeah, you could then use the rock, but it is like the most expensive, most complicated, most difficult thing you could possibly imagine. So uh, better to just mine an asteroid. William Bayes, 
How will the base on the moon be powered? The moon is tidally locked with Earth, so half the time the base will be pointed away from the sun. Solar panels are out. Would those nuclear batteries that's used on the Mars rovers just be scaled up? You can definitely imagine some future lunar colony using some kind of nuclear reactor, a fission reactor, uh, to be able to supply itself with the energy that it requires to run everything. Because you're exactly right. For half of the time, one side of the moon is facing at the sun, and then half the time the moon is facing away from the sun. For 14 days at a time, you would be without solar power. But there's actually a couple of places you can go which are perfect for this. So if you go to the poles of the moon, then there are places, there are mountains that are permanently in sunlight and there are craters that are permanently in shadow. And so what you would probably do is you would set up your base in one of those shadowed craters where there's probably deposits of water ice. You'd run cables up the mountain and then you'd set your solar panels up where they track the sun and they're in constant sunlight and they run the power down to your moon station. So you can have the best of both worlds. So that's what they'll probably do down the road. That's why every, there's so much attention to the south pole and north pole of the moon because that's sort of the best places to be able to harvest resources, have power, and be able to explore the moon. Liquid flames. I was reading about the Parker Solar Probe. Everyone always says that it's way harder to go to the sun than to go out towards Mars. I can't find out why that is. I thought that if you wanted to go inward, you just need to slow down. Is that not right? Yeah, the sun is the hardest place to get to in the entire solar system. So the Earth is orbiting around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. And unless you can cancel out that orbital velocity of 30 kilometers per second, it, you're just going to go into a different orbit around the sun. I think that's the part that people sort of don't understand or have a trouble kind of wrapping their head around, right? Is that say you launch off of the Earth and now you're, you're in orbit around the Earth and then you escape the Earth's orbit and now you're in orbit around the sun. So you're essentially going 30 kilometers per second like the Earth, but now you're moving away from the Earth. Like the stereo spacecraft we talked about earlier. So you take your spacecraft and you fire the thrusters to change your velocity to say 29 kilometers a second. You, you kill one kilometer per second of your velocity. So now you're in a different orbit. You're not spiraling inward down into the sun, you just are now in a different orbit. You're on a bit of an elliptical path that's going to take you out as far as the Earth, but it's going to take you a little closer to the sun, and now you just got a completely different orbit. And you'll stay on this orbit now forever until you fire your rocket again. And it's only when you can gain a total of 30 kilometers per second of velocity, essentially canceling out all that speed that you could actually fall down into the sun. And in fact, the escape velocity of the solar system is about 15 and a half, 16 kilometers per second. So it's easier to leave the solar system than it is to actually fall into the sun. And that's why it's so tough. Matt Brookbank. Couldn't humans or our machines just dig deep enough into a moon or planet where the surface is too cold and irradiated to live and be very comfortable? Like deep enough into Mars or our moon is molten because of the pressure, right? Just stop when you get deep enough to wear a t-shirt and put an airtight cap on the tunnel and make the air pressure mixture right. You are exactly correct. You could dig a tunnel down on the moon, dig down through the rock, and the deeper you go, and I'm not sure the exact distance, but it's going to get warmer and warmer. Like the core of the moon is like 1500 degrees Celsius. So that's hot, right? Hot enough to, I don't know, cook fish. I don't know what the temperature is. <laughs> but the point is, um, you could go down, dig down, dig down. Maybe you're gonna have to go 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, that the temperature is gonna warm up. And you could probably find this perfect spot where you've got all of your human activity, you're running your, all your machines, and normally it would be too cold, but the heat is radiating away and it's like the perfect temperature. You don't have to worry about, about heaters down there. And you're exactly right. You seal up the tunnels, air pressurize them, and boom, you're living in a tunnel uh, deep under the surface of the moon or Mars. And in fact, this is why the lava tubes on Mars and the moon are so interesting for researchers because these are places which are better protected than just the surface of the moon. And so some of the first places that explorers will probably go and maybe try to set up bases on the moon or Mars is in some of these lava tubes. Because, you know, there, these old lava tubes, the, the ceilings collapsed, 
and then explorers could go inside, maybe seal up the roof again, and now you're protected from the radiation, you're protected from the temperature changes. It's actually mild down there. As long as you can get your atmosphere in there, now you're living on a great big natural tunnel, and that's a place to get started to build a more complicated, you know, the, the lunar base I was mentioning earlier with with your solar panels up on the mountains and you're extracting your water ice and stuff. So, so the lava tubes are going to be the first place to go. And actually, we did a whole video about that and I will, uh, I'll link that here. Hiroshi Nakamura. I'm still unsuccessfully trying to find out if the Earth is located rather upwards, north in the flat galactic disk of the Milky Way, or rather downwards, south, or maybe exactly in the middle, say about 500 light years to each border. That's a great question, and I have brought in a special guest answerer to handle this question. It's my friend Simon Dan, who normally does a channel where he helps explain scientific concepts to people who maybe don't agree with him. But uh, I gave him a refreshing opportunity to answer just a pure question about space and astronomy. So take it away, Simon Dan. Hi, Frazier. Thank you very, very much for allowing me to take part in one of your Q&As. And Hiroshi, what a great question. A galaxy is a complex astronomical object. So I can understand the curiosity when it comes to thinking about our own place within one. Let me help you out with that. Just like our own sun, the Milky Way is a modest size. At 100,000 light years across, there are many, many galaxies that can dwarf our own. At the centre of our galaxy, we have a bulge that is approximately 12,000 light years in diameter. But we don't need to worry about that because our solar system is located in the main disk, which is approximately 1,000 light years thick. And surrounding all of that, is a halo of older stars and globular clusters, some of which have been stated at being more than 200,000 light years away. But again, we don't need to look here when it comes to our own solar system. If we were to look at the Milky Way from the top down, we would see that our solar system would be located at just over 25,000 light years from the galactic center, situated on one of the galaxy's arms called the Orion Spur. To answer your question specifically, Hiroshi, the solar system isn't exactly where you think it would be. It actually sits just above that disk, roughly 20 light years above. But that's not the end of the story though. We aren't even lined up with the Milky Way. The two planes are seriously mismatched, with the Milky Way and the celestial equator having a difference of up to 60 degrees. So there we go, Hiroshi, a comprehensive guide as to our exact location in the Milky Way. Thanks again, Frazier, for having me on. Bye. All right, thanks, Dan, that was awesome. Uh, great to hear you uh, talking about something that has nothing to do with the topology of our planet. I appreciate that. So I hope you guys all had fun. If you haven't already, go check out Simon Dan's channel. I promise you will be hooked. You'll watch video after video. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's very, it's very interesting. All right. So that's it. Those are all our questions. As always, I really appreciate you sending me your ideas. Uh, if a question pops in your brain, anywhere across my channel, write it down and I will gather them up and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.